let's talk about personas. But before we do, I want to clue you in to a truth about integrated marketing. The truth is, integrated marketing is easy to say, but it's hard to do. Why is it hard? It's hard because it requires focus, discipline, and stamina. Too many marketing campaigns have failed because of the loss of stamina, focus, uh, direction. Too many times, politics gets in the way of executing a really good marketing strategy, and decisions become made by he who yells the loudest, as opposed to well-rounded facts and hypothesis based in customer data. So for that, to stay on track, we need a persona. But where did this notion of a persona come from, and why is it so important? Sometimes it's helpful to look backwards at our history to see where we were from a marketing standpoint in order to understand how marketing works today and where we need to go in the future. So if I were to ask you to define for me, what is marketing? Many of you would probably list out the commonplace uh, activities that come up. Uh, webcasts, marketing is webcasts, newsletters, sales, podcasts, coupons, et cetera, et cetera. And you'd be right. Marketing is the sum of activities coupled together to help sell and promote a product. No problem. But if that's marketing, here's the next question. What is integrated marketing? Integrated marketing is the thoughtful combination and connection of relevant marketing messages and tactics that are used to tell a story and engage the audience. It's the equivalent of parts flying in close formation versus an actual airplane. So let me ask you, which, which of these would you rather ride in? The same is true when it comes from marketing and why integrated marketing is so hard. So let me see if I can pull some of these pieces together. Now, I'm 56 years old. I don't look old, but I do remember the pre-internet days. And in 1990, I remember reading an article on the Washington Post that was called Ads. They're everywhere. And that intrigued me. And in reading it, the premise of this article was that the average person in 1990, this is a good five or six years before the real concept of the internet had any kind of meaning in a marketplace perspective. So the Washington Post hypothesized that the average person, you and I, would be hit by more than 3,000 messages every day. And I thought, well, that's a pretty bold claim. That can't possibly be true. And so I decided to do my own little mini experiment. And on the work one day, I had a 20 minute commute to get from my home to the office. I decided to count the number of ads I would encounter along the way. Now the ads would be anything from billboards to bumper stickers, to signs, to logos, and anything that would present a message to me that said, hey, I'm here, pay attention. And in the 20 minutes that it took me to get to work, I lost count after 200. So now the concept of 3000 messages every day, and that didn't even include television. And remember, email was in its infancy. There was, there was not a lot of that going on back then, but 3000 became a reasonable number. In fact, I also remember later that year, I was uh, vacationing up at Lake Tahoe and went up to ski at the top of uh, one of the hills. And I noticed after I got off the ski lift, what I was met with was a billboard for Marlboro cigarettes. And I thought, gosh, I came all this way out here to get away from civilization. And here's this billboard standing me in my face. So 3000 messages every day. And here's the punchline. 99% of them were irrelevant. So now let's fast forward to today. How many messages do you think the average person is hit with every day? And in a number of articles that I found over the years that the number has surpassed 10,000. And that assumes you have a good spam filter. So what does this mean for the given marketer? How do we combat all this noise in the marketplace? What this means is that every single marketing activity, our strategies need to be so focused, so relevant to our target uh, buyers, our target personas, that they can cut through the noise of the clutter to be relevant and be heard. And that, my friends, is why 
integrated marketing is so hard because there's such a temptation to try to be all things to all people, to cast your net as wide as possible because of the fear of missing a sale, of missing an opportunity. And so that fear of missing overcomes the need to focus. Oftentimes, I hear this lament, Mike, I know half of my marketing investment is wasted, but I don't know which half. Well, here's the deal. I can actually tell you which half is wasted. All I have to do is look at your strategy and see if you have a well-crafted persona. Most of the time, companies don't. And when you don't, it's easy to see where the messages go off track, where the offers are wrong, and where you've just added to confusion in the marketplace. We need a tool to combat that. And that's where the per persona fits in. Bear with me for a minute and let me share how this is relevant for today. So when we go back to World War II, American men went off to war by the thousands, by the hundreds of thousands. And women took up the jobs in the factory. They helped keep our nation running. And even so, because of the dramatic war effort, uh, we've got now women working in the marketplace. Uh, there's a lot of focus on what needs to be done and rationing now becomes commonplace. We needed to ration many of our uh, carefully uh, identified resources and we need to cut back. And so dreams of family life were put on hold as we navigated through this war process. The war ends in 1945 and all these fighting men and women come home and they want to resume their interrupted lives. They had deferred dreams that they put on hold to look for uh, the greater country's needs. And now when they return, they said, hey, it's, it's my turn. I'm gonna get married. I wanna have a family. I wanna have the life that I wanna have because I've given to my country and now it's time for me to get back. And Americans wanted it all. Out of this, a new hero emerged in American society. And that hero was that of the manufacturer. The goal was to develop more goods in less time. And these heroes were no nonsense. Roll up your sleeves, people. Here's an example. Take Henry Ford, and Henry Ford would mass produce automobiles. And the saying at the time was, you could have any color you want as long as it's black. And the reason so was having to do with the assembly line and to mass produce as many of these autos as possible. We couldn't, uh, they couldn't take into account variations of various styles or options. Everything was uniform and the color was uniform. So you could have any color you wanted as long as it was black. This then led to the notion of mass marketing. This is where mass marketing came from. And it followed the lines of distribution, which were not surprisingly the same lines used for the military, for the war effort. There was a wholesaler, selling to a reseller and ultimately to consumer. And these lines of distribution with supply depots for the supply chain was mirroring exactly what we had already set up for the previous five years during the war. Coupled with this were advertising blitzes that aim to showcase all the new merchandise available to all. So remember, we have this very hungry population of men, women, and new families who wanted it all. They want to, their uh, dreams were deferred no longer, and they wanted to have all the best uh, items that they had put off. And so they eagerly lined up to purchase these, and they were mass produced and distributed in a uniform way across the country. Let's fast forward again to the 1960s. So now it's 10 years later and marketing starts to take a little bit of a hold. There's a little bit of a sense that maybe the market isn't quite a uniform market. Maybe there are some differences uh, that people want. Uh, and this is where the, the concept of in marketing, what's known as the four P's came about, the thinking about product, price, place, and promotion. And there's a formula for adapting these principles in order to bring your product to market, to sell the most, to be the most successful in the market. And because we're still following the roots of mass marketing, the notion of caveat emptor, which is Latin for let the buyer beware, put the obligation on the buyer 
to make sure that they were buying what they thought that they were buying. The responsibility was on the buyer, not on the manufacturer. The manufacturer just wanted to sell as many goods in uniform fashion as possible, and it was up to the buyer to make sure that they were purchasing the right thing. Now, it wasn't all that difficult because the choices were somewhat limited. Nevertheless, there was a little bit of, shall I say, contempt towards the buyer because we were treated all as a uniform entity. Let's spring forward another 10, 20 years, and we've got other elements of history that now were impacting the profile of the American buyer. So we had all things from Vietnam and uh, uh, people speaking out against the war effort. We had new styles in fashion for women. We had the evolution of punk rock and new types of music further differentiating and segmenting what was perhaps originally thought of as a homogeneous customer base. We had new technology come into place and fashion in the 80s uh, continued to be very individualistic. There was lots of variation now coming onto the market. And so Ted Levitt in his book, Marketing Myopia, had this famous quote, there is no such thing as a growth industry, only consumer needs which may shift at any time. And I would add, and they often do. This became the mantra or the preamble to a new generation of thinking about marketing. So now we come into the 1990s and we've shifted even further because whereas the uh, marketing landscape started to recognize that there were people who maybe were not homogeneous, but new realities uh, continued to take shape. And there was a new age of what was called the empowered buyer. People choosing what messages they listen to and people talking back. Now remember, this is long before social media, but word and mouth, uh, other uh, venues via uh, radio or talk shows, uh, other types of forums were starting to come forth where people could actually express an opinion back to the manufacturer. Oh my God, this is a brand new concept now taking firm roots. The family unit has been defined. Dad is no longer the only breadwinner. You can see we're starting to break down some of the stereotypes of what a typical buyer would be. And people would now start to define themselves with groups. And now this led to this notion of niche marketing. Niche marketing is about marketing to subsets of people who behave similarly. And so the uh, notion of caveat emptor was thrown out. A new notion, caveat emptorum, beware of the buyer, now took forth. Now this is huge because the power is shifting from the manufacturer to the consumer. And those manufacturers who did not treat the consumer with respect, soon found themselves losing money and in many cases, eventually out of business. This leads to today where, and it's cliche to say it, but the internet has changed everything. People are individuals who make their own choices and the advent of social media meant that you could engage people in a one-on-one -on -one perspective. Today, it's all about one-on-one -on -one marketing. It's about the personalization and the advent of big data and the analytics that, analytics that go with it and all the tools that are being talked about today and advisory boards uh, across industries are all about the power of the individual and personalization, which has dramatically changed the way that we have gone to market. And it didn't just happen. It happened because of the steps that I've walked you through in this brief history lesson. So in summary, we've moved from mass marketing to niche marketing now to one-on-one -on -one marketing. And here's the kicker. If it's all about one thing, it's about the customer, not the product. Those manufacturers who can think in terms of honoring and respecting the consumer as a consumer of one, who have individual needs and wants to be catered to, those manufacturers who understand that and embrace that level of personalizations are the ones that are going to succeed into the future. So what does this mean? from a persona perspective. Well, now as you've seen, it's not a mass market. We're now on one-on-one, -on -one, but now for marketing, it's a, it's a little daunting to say, gee, I have to market to a market of one. That would cripple anybody. So this notion of personas about aligning or grouping people of 
uh, reasonable background expectations, experiences, problems they're trying to solve is a helpful tool for guidance. So I mentioned earlier that some executives would say, half of my marketing investment is wasted, but I don't know which half. Actually, I can tell you, if you've got a persona that's well-crafted and targeted where you understand what the buyer is trying to do and you have empathy for where the buyer is and where they're going, you are more likely to have a successful marketing campaign and your successful marketing outcome of the investment that you make. If you don't have it, if you try to be all things to all people, if you're sloppy, if you're lazy, you're gonna miss it and that marketing investment is going to be wasted. You'll go to the wrong venues, you'll have the wrong messaging, you'll have the wrong offer. We can no longer afford that today. The key to the persona is having empathy for the people we're trying to sell to. And the persona is a, is a tool that will enable that. So this is all by way of background to introduce you to the concept of the persona. I use a template that uh, is a tool for engaging in discussion within the company to try to understand who these target people are. What type of companies do they work for? What's the profile of the ideal company who would buy your product? And then ultimately the psychographics, how and why do they think that the way that they do? These are three dimensions of a target persona. We, need, we as marketers need to understand to be successful. And that's why I've designed this course to allow us to play with this tool, to challenge our assumptions and to align and guide our organization to be successful in the marketing programs that it executes. And with that, within this course, I have 10 steps that will guide you and your team through success and will give you the recipe for doing all of these. I hope you'll join me in my class on personas and how to develop, develop your best persona possible.